Hi, I'm Annie Bossler, and I co-authored College Prep for Musicians, and I also uh, produced and directed one in one Hollywood Horn to the Golden Years, and this is Musicality Now. Hi, my name's Christopher, I'm the founder and director of Musical You, and welcome to Musicality Now. Today I'm joined by Annie Bosler, an LA French hornist who has performed with the likes of John Williams, Josh Groban, Michael Feinstein, Itzhak Perlman, and Paul McCartney. She's played for internationally famous TV shows like Glee and The Ellen Show, and recently performed at the 2020 Grammy Awards. Now, you might imagine that such a high-level performer must be long past any concerns of stage fright or performance anxiety. But as you'll hear in this conversation, that's actually not the case at all. And Annie shares some really valuable insights on how top-level professional musicians actually think about and actively tackle performance anxiety and reach their peak performance. In this conversation, we talk about the relationship between performance anxiety, flow states, and getting into the zone where everything seems to happen in slow motion. We talk about the specific components of Annie's own peak performance toolkit and what you might like to try out for yourself. And Annie shares the lessons she learned from interviewing some of the original Hollywood studio musicians of the golden years. Whatever your own level of performance and experience with nerves and flow states might be, I know that this is going to be enlightening for you both in an overall sense and with some useful nitty-gritty specifics. My name's Christopher Sutton and this is Musicality Now from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Annie. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So you have an incredibly impressive CV in terms of the musicians you have performed with, and you are a French horn player to boot. So a, a fascinating individual to begin with, but you've also co-authored a really terrific book and produced a very interesting movie and given talks that are super fascinating. So there's a lot to talk about, but I wonder if we could start at the beginning and learn a little bit about Annie Bosler, the musician, where you came from, when you started, and what your own musical trajectory has been like. Sure. So I um, actually grew up in South Carolina on a farm, um, a beef farm with cows. And so for me, uh, I was kind of a little bit of the black sheep in the family in terms of the one who did music. And so now that I live in Los Angeles, everybody's like, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but um, I grew up, uh, you know, very fortunate to get to drive an hour and a half each way to take French horn lessons. And one of the big highlights of my high school career was I got to play um, in the an all state band, which I know a lot of people have, have done such a thing, but for me it was really a game changer because we played a piece um, Nimrod by Elgar from Enigma Variations, and it was one of the things where I was sitting on stage at the at all state, and I was just in this wash of sound. And there's if if you know the piece, there's not honestly that most of a amazing for torn part, and so it was being in this huge wash of sound, and I just. Um, it just changed my life. And I just said, I want to be in, in the middle of this sound for forever. <laughs> and so um, uh, it, that just is basically what started, started everything. And so from there, I went on to do my undergrad in French horn. And um, I had a similar experience when I went off to college. Um, uh, and I went, got to hear the Pittsburgh Symphony on a pretty regular basis. And I'd never heard Alpine Symphony. And so I think I was a freshman and I got to go sit in the Symphony Hall, and I, it was the same experience. I mean, granted, I wasn't in the orchestra, but I was in the audience, and the same wash of sound happened again, and it was so intense that I cried the whole performance. I mean, I'll start crying if I talk about this too much, but I, I cried the entire performance. I cried the whole bus ride home. I cried for the next hour after it, and I just said, I have to be a part of this. So, um, you know, that took me then to Los Angeles uh, for a master's and doctorate, and, and I've been very fortunate to get to do you know, many different things where, where I get to be in this wash of sound all the time. And it's, I feel crazy fortunate um, to be, you know, a professional musician. Amazing. And I won't reel off the names of all of the incredible musicians you've played with over the years, but I wonder if you could pick out a few highlights. I know that you were recently performing at the Grammys, for example. <laughs> um, yeah, I was really fortunate to get to play at the Grammys uh, just this last weekend with um, Ariana Grande. I played second horn there. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'll tell you the one that I would say is my parents' favorite highlight, um, which is funny because my mom's always like, what kind of concerts are you doing? Oh, okay. And then, but when I called about this one, she's like, oh, you've, you've really made it. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I got, um, I was really fortunate to get asked to play on a CBS special, which honored the Beatles. And I think in my lifetime, I never, ever once thought I would get asked to play with 
Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, you know, the two remaining Beatles. Um, but we did, and um, they, they had four French horns on the stage, and we did Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club, um, and also Hey Jude. And it was one of those things where we showed up not knowing at all who we were going to play with. Um, they just said it's a, a special honoring the Beatles. And um, we didn't know which, which artist we would play with. And to get asked to play with them, obviously, is beyond a highlight. And uh, when we were showed up on stage, um, we had just known we were playing Sgt. Peppers. And then we were asked to play Hey Jude on the spot. And so <laughs> it's a good thing the horn section had, you know, we all listened, had listened to it um, you know, known it well, but so we just put the chords in with the group and it was just amazing. And my mom and dad obviously were over the moon, but I think for them, that was a, you know, you've now made it in music, <laughs> even though I've done millions of concerts before that, that was a, a, a big highlight. So it's hard to beat playing with Paul and Ringo. <laughs> it, I, yeah, I just, I can't describe it. It was, and it was live national, uh, worldwide national television. So, you know, it's uh, not, not, not a tiny bit of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the things I most wanted to talk about with you today is musicians and pressure. And obviously this would be a theme in your book, College Prep for Musicians, where certainly in the US, the audition to get into college to study music is a huge thing and potentially a seriously intimidating thing. But um, yeah, I'm sure many of us who haven't gone that route can only imagine the, the intense pressure for teenagers. But obviously performance anxiety and the pressure of performing is something that pretty much every musician and music learner has to grapple with at some point. And so I'd love to hear a bit of your perspective on that. And maybe we could begin by just talking about how you experienced that for yourself growing up before you became such an expert in the topic. What was it like for you? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll be straight up and honest. I deal with it every day. I deal with performance anxiety, um, you know, no matter what concert I play. I think any any professional that doesn't say that they do at some point might not be telling the truth <laughs> um, because I, I really do. I think everybody does deal with it. I think some people have more tools and more um, experience and they've learned to, to tackle it. Um, but I've, you know, I've felt everything from all the physical symptoms to definitely the mental symptoms where you're, you know, you're going to miss this note. This is not going well, whatever. Um, and so it's something that I, I work on, honestly, all the time. And so um, I, I'll tell you when I first experienced it was I, I was fortunate to play college tennis. So that was, um, you know, part of my, my college experience. Um, I was on the tennis team there and I would, I would find myself honestly choking in matches. And so what would happen was I was always better than the player um, and I would get to the, to the point where I should be, have beaten the player, but I would always feel that I wasn't good enough to win somehow. I wasn't good enough to, to tackle it. And so I had a coach, um, th this was, I, honestly, I dealt with this mostly before college, but I had a coach in high school. Um, his name was Bill Jolly. He's, he's like a, a second grandfather to me, honest, or third grandfather to me, honestly. Um, but he basically taught me how to win. Um, and, and what he taught me was, you know, there's, there's all sides, sides, uh, the physical side to playing and there's, there's the mental side. Um, but he taught me a lot about visualization. And my dad also was a college uh, football player. And, and so, you know, he grew up uh, listening to things like Maxwell Maltz, Maltz uh, Psycho-Cybernetics, which if people never listen to, that's a great start. Um, and so, um, you know, so, so anyway, so, so I tackled it really through tennis before I, I hit the music side. And so I would do a lot of visualization on the court um, uh, and off the court. Uh, trying to really recreate points in my head and, and work on closing points and winning points. Um, and the way that translated to music was I started to use the same, excuse me, I started to use the same visualization process when um, preparing for auditions and preparing for, for big concerts or concerts. And so um, for me, the visualization is something that not a lot of musicians know about from the athletic side that I think is super important. And what the way you do it is you just start from the beginning, you know, you picture yourself, like you picture the stage or the place where you're going to perform, even if it's a lesson or you're going to go play duets with friends or whatnot, you, you picture yourself walking into the room, you picture yourself, all the feelings that you're going to feel. If you're going to feel nervous, you picture it. Um, and then you picture everything up to when you sit down, you play. Um, and then if anything goes negatively in your mind, you, I always will pause and try to, you, you accept it. Don't, you know, don't say this is terrible, but you, you accept it and then kind of pause and then walk yourself through it in a positive way. And whenever I give talks in front of uh, musicians, I will do a visualization and I always ask them, I'll say, okay, pick a piece of music in your head and, and visualize it from start to finish. And then when you're, when we're done with that, you know, a minute later, I'll say, okay, raise your hand if you made a mistake. And literally like 
90% of the room has made a mistake while listening to it in their head, which is hilarious to me because you haven't even played your instrument, you know? And so um, the visualization is really fascinating because on, on the sports side, you're, you know, you're working out the points in your head and you should always be winning the points, um, you know, or, or at least seeing a positive version of it going through. And so on the music side, you're seeing the same thing happen. You're seeing a positive experience take place of that piece. And so I think um, it's something that a lot more, more musicians can use and um, my husband's also a French horn player and when we, when he or I are preparing for big auditions we always talk about a lot you know how's your visualization going are you seeing yourself play great and so I think that's something that that everyone can use um, and if you if you'd like I'll take it back a second to all the the other sides of um, performance anxiety because there's obviously a lot there's the physical side and the mental side um, but I, I would say every you know if, if preparation is a very big part of me handling um, performance anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and and also really making sure I get a lot of sleep. Um, uh, if you know, I find that the chatter in your brain, and to be honest, I didn't really understand that other people heard chatter in their head until I was in my early twenties, and I, I came across Don Green's, the the famous music uh, performance psychologist. I think it's been on your show before. Um, I came across his material and then I was like, wait, other people hear things in their head. You know, I was like, I just saw this crazy person who heard voices in my head that were telling me what, how I was going to play this piece. And then once I realized that those existed and I could actually control them or at least not control them, but, but use them to my advantage. Um, so one of the big tools I use of Dawn's that I got from one of his books is that you name the voice in your head. And I always think that you give it a funny name, like something you don't, somebody you don't encounter on a daily basis, like in your life. So um, I use Bartholomew because I don't have any Bartholomew friends. And, and mine's a, mine's a, I actually think my voice is a female voice in my head, but I, I call him or her Bartholomew just because I like that one. And so whenever, um, technically it's a she, I guess, comes in my head, um, I send it outside the door. Uh, so if I'm on stage, I pick a door and I say, Bartholomew, you're going to go outside that door and you're going to stay there until I'm done. And I will pick you up on the way back. So we're, we're still hanging out, but you're going to stay there until I'm done with this performance. And so there's multiple times. Like, so if I'm in a show, there's often like 10, 15, 20, maybe a hundred times I say, Bartholomew, you're there. And so that's where, um, you know, I use that tool all the time. Um, I've used things, I mean, I've, I've honestly, I've tried so many things before, but I would say the other big factors, I think, is hydration. So whether you're a string player, a percussionist, a pianist, um, particularly winds, particularly voice, um, uh, hydration is huge. And I, I've talked to a lot of nutritionists over the years about how much should you hydrate. And uh, the, the biggest number I've gotten is take half your body weight, make it an ounce, to, uh, take half your body weight, turn it into ounces. So let's just say you weigh, you know, 120 pounds, that's 60 ounces of water. That's what you're supposed to drink every single day. And that's not Gatorade or Coke or coffee or tea. That's straight up solid water. And um, I think for things like dry mouth, um, you know, just climate altitude changes, if you happen to be traveling to play a show, I'll, this is super, super important. And so the water is really key in, in clutch in, in terms of those things. So what I do is if the concert's on a Saturday, I try to count uh, basically 72 hours out um, from that show, and that's when I start to hydrate. And so I'm always constantly preparing. And my husband, um, he plays lots of, of big studio stuff, and so he's all the time carrying, he has a 32-ounce bottle of water, and I can't even tell you the number of times he fills it. I mean, he's a little heavier than I am in terms of weight, but, you know, he'll, he'll fill it up just a ton of times a day. And the last thing I would say that's really um, big in, in terms of the chatter is sleep. And so I think um, I have a, a, a one-year-old, which we were talking about earlier, but I have a one-year-old um, right now. And so sleep is <laughs> sadly something that's few and far between sometimes. Um, and so, um, you know, it's a constant battle to get enough hours. Um, and so I always find if I don't have enough, that chatter is crazy loud and going, going really strong. And so my recommendation is just try to get sleep. In, and there's all these books and things about how many hours you should get. Um, I, I just, I think it's up to the person. Um, some people can function great off. I know some, some big time professional first one players that only get six hours a night and they function fantastic. I know others that get eight to 10 and, and that's great. Um, but I think it's just up to the person. So there's, you know, many programs out there you can try. So the, just to, to, I mean, just to go back to it, I, I, I think I experience it on a daily basis. I work on it on a daily basis, but the difference I think between, you know, someone who, doesn't do this day in and day out and, and someone that is a professional is that uh, 
I, I would say there's just more tools and you have to find the tools that work for you and just have a, have a, a gamut of tools in your, your, your tool bag basically. And you just go to them if something's not working. Um, so, so that's, that's what I would say in terms of a crash course in, in dealing with nerves. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I know that solely to hear from someone like yourself who's played with the big names and had such a fantastic career to hear that you experience performance anxiety and that you are actively using these kinds of tools that people hear about as part of your toolkit that in itself i think is hugely valuable because i think otherwise there's a risk that we see them as you know the crutches that beginners need and real professionals wouldn't need to do all that stuff and actually as you say the vast majority if not all professional musicians experience these symptoms and have their toolkit of ways to handle it or reduce it happening in the first place. And I'll just throw there real quick too, there's a great documentary by John Bader. Um, it's, I'm pretty sure it's called Composed. And so he goes, he, it's an hour, I think it's an hour and a half long. I saw it premiered in LA, it's fantastic. But he goes through um, musicians that, um, you know, have, he, he talks to you know, hundreds of musicians and he does lots of surveys. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations, he and I, about different things and and it's you know he he proves that that so many musicians are dealing with what we're talking about and just how do they deal with it what do they do so um you know i think there's a lot you know between don green's material uh john bader's documentary i think there's a lot of uh places and ways that people can you know look into uh get, getting their sorry i think there's a lot of ways people can expand their toolkit Absolutely. And one thing I loved in your talk, The Healthy Musician, which I saw a video of online, was that you shared this survey you had done of hundreds of musicians asking them, what's in your toolkit? What do you use regularly to cope with this stuff? And we've already touched on a few like visualization and being careful about sleep and hydration. The other two that really stood out were meditation and breathing, which maybe go hand in hand to some extent. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about those. Sure. Um, so you know, there's, there's a whole world of meditation and there's thousands of ways to meditate, you know, spiritual ways, non-spiritual ways. Um, and I personally, I use one, there's a, a voice teacher named Irene Gabrud um, and her stuff, I met her in Aspen at the music festival and she was a voice teacher there. And she also ran a meditation class, which honestly changed my world. Um, and so she has a, a bunch of different types of uh, meditations. And my favorite of hers is a, just straight up a breathing meditation, because I feel like as a wind player, we, you know, a brass player, we breathe. And so that's something I need on stage. And I find particularly for me, if I, if I get feel nervous, my breath is one of the first things that go. And so my philosophy on it is that it's just like practicing, you know, it's like playing a million third space C's or whatever. If you, um, if you, the more you meditate, the more you have it in your system and it's a recall. And so you can recall it on the spot on the stage. Um, and so for me, if I start to feel you know, uber nervous, I'll go back to the breathing. And and I've done her tapes so many times that I can literally hear a voice in my head and my whole body just goes like, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's amazing. And um, the, another thing I just learned in the last few years, because um, I've been fortunate to, to work a lot with Do uh, Dr. Don Green, is he has a centering technique and it's um, it he sells it on his website, um, when, uh, winningonstage.com. And so, but it's, uh, you, his, his, I've, I've started using his also in the last several years. And so between Irene's and his, I feel like I've got a really good toolkit of kind of things to hone in on. I mean, nothing still goes perfect. I play for Torn, um, you know, but, um, but it's, uh, it, I feel like I have some good tools to go to. And so Don's it's uh, centering and it's take, it takes a while to, to master it. I mean, not a while, but like repetitions. And so, uh, what, what I would say with that is it's, it's interesting. Cause I, I use for his centering technique, I use the stand pole. And so basically one of the things is if you're, if your eyes go above eye level, it usually means you're accessing left brain. So if I'm kind of up here talking, I'm thinking and I'm accessing left brain, but if, so he picks something below eye level. And so, um, and left brain is where all the chatter is. Um, so it's something below eye level. So, so centering takes you there and, and it's a process. He has kind of like three different forms of it, basic, intermediate, advanced. And once you get through all the forms, um, then, uh, you can start to do it really quickly. So I, I bet I have centering down to a blink of an eye. That's how fast I can do it. And I, for me, as I look at the stand pole, I'm centered. And so all the, all the right, left brain stuff, right brain is a lot of like visualization sometimes. Um, uh, sorry, visual stuff like movies, that kind of thing in your brain. If you're starting to like daydream a little, that's right brain and left brain is more the chatter. And so for me, if I center, 
it's boom, I'm like right back in. Um, and so I bet I center who oh, like 150 times a concert sometimes, or if I'm in a recording session, because a lot of times what happens is, you know, they'll, they'll go to a different instrument or they stripe, which means they, they record the strings and the brass and the winds and the percussion or however they decide to do it. And so we'll be sitting there for sometimes 45 minutes. And then you have to come in a bunch of times to record your, your parts. And so every time I'm centering, 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 centering. Um, and if you, I've, I've watched some other players too. It's kind of, um, Don calls it the, the wink, wink club. So that like, you know, if you're on stage and you see people kind of like do this thing, um, you can kind of tell who's centering and who's not, or who's using meditation and who's not by how they approach their entrances. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, I, I would say I've watched some some big name folks who do similar things, and it's it's really cool um, to see see that happening. But my husband uses it all the time. I use it all the time. Um, so I think meditation, and there's a, just you know, there's if, if centering is great. There's a million forms of meditation um, out there. So there's you can meditate on a feeling. Um, you know, you can do everything from like breathe into your heart, like really open that up, feel feelings of love, um, feel feelings of calm. Um, the visualization is obviously great. Um, you can meditate on a word. I mean, there's just so many different types of meditations. And so my my one biggest piece of information that I would say is it takes practice. And so, you know, it's something that you could use even if you're not on stage as a musician. Let's say your professional life is you talk or you lead meetings or you, um, you know, you just have to write a really intense email. Learn, learn to use some of these skills and do it over and over. And then it will actually bleed into your playing and onto stage and all, all that kind of thing. So... I hope I answered yeah. the question. <laughs> Absolutely. And I really appreciated a comment you made in that talk because you just said something about centering and how you can do it now in the blink of an eye. And you said something a bit similar about meditation in that talk, which was now that you've done meditation regularly, you can kind of remember the feeling of being calm and at peace and just tap into that directly in the moment. And that's definitely something I've found really valuable from meditation is, yes, it kind of sets you up for the day. And yes, you kind of develop this mindfulness, but it also just gives you a very visceral sense of what it means to be in that ideal state. And that's something you don't need to sit there for 20 minutes to get to necessarily. You can just kind of channel. There's even a great app out right now called Headspace. If, if you haven't, I think it's an annual fee, but it's got all kinds of different meditations. Kenny Werner has a great book called Effortless Mastery. So, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, I mentioned Irene's stuff and Dawn's stuff. There's so many different great tools, again, for your toolkit. That's, that's the most important. I think it's just fill that kit up with all kinds of stuff. So if something's not working, you go to the next thing. <laughs> that's at least what I try. <laughs> but again, I still play for George, so, you know. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about the kind of toolkit you can have to, as it were, stop bad things happening and avoid performance anxiety. But there is a flip side, which is kind of the getting into the zone or getting into flow that you talk about a little bit um, when you speak. I wonder if you could share your experience with that and maybe the relationship between, you know, performance anxiety at one end of things and being totally in the flow at the other end of things. Sure. So for me, I first experienced what I would call the zone um, when I was in, uh, playing tennis. And it, it was a wild thing because I'd always, uh, there's a fantastic tennis coach that, that I used to go every summer and work with. Um, he taught at Clemson University in South Carolina and his name's Chuck Creasy. And he's, he wrote some amazing books um, and he, he's really big into the mental side. And he would always talk about uh, the zone in tennis, they call it treeing. It's like, there's, you know, there's all these different terms for, for it. Um, but I never experienced it until one tennis match one day. Um, and I just, it was crazy fascinating. The, the ball was coming across the net and it just literally felt like the whole thing was in slow motion. And so it was almost like I could see every particle or every thread or hair on the ball. And so it's coming across the net and you go to hit it and it's, it, you hit the ball and, and you're back in real time. And then it comes back at you and it's just back in slow motion. And so this experience was surreal. And I just was like, this must be the zone, but I, I, I didn't think about it in the moment. It was, it was after the whole match was over. And honestly, the entire match was like that. It was the coolest feeling ever. And it, I was just in it, just going through the motions. And um, I mean, I, I won the match. It was like, again, you know, I was right, right in the, in the moment for the whole thing. And so um, I kept thinking to myself, wow, I wonder if I can experience this on, on horn or in music. And it wasn't until I was in my, uh, I guess it was my master's or doctorate at, at USC, um, University of Southern California in LA, when I was taking an audition and I, it's like we were talking about earlier, like I, I put in all, we, um, 
we were preparing for an audition to for someone to to play principal horn on Ein Hildenleben, which has giant horn parts. And um, I, you know, I did all this prep. I was like super ready. And I was always this, the person, like I would always do good in auditions, but I'd never like really won something on horn. Um, and I, you know, I'd been doing great in tennis. When, when I first met that coach that I was telling about, Bill Jolly, he took my, my tennis game from like, I was 104 in the state to four, like in like six months. That's, that's what he had taught me, all these mental and physical skills about how to take things to the next level. And so in tennis, it was like, I always were trying to figure out how do I get to this next level? I mean, sorry, in horn, I was trying to figure out how do I get to this next level? And so um, I was curious if I would experience this on horn. And so I was um, I did all the preparation for Unheld Lane, was super prepared, did tons of repetitions on every excerpt, and then um, was doing tons of meditation. So I hadn't met, I hadn't, uh, sorry, at that time, I didn't know Dawn's centering technique. So I was using Irene Gabrud's meditation. And so I was doing that. I did it right before I walked into the audition. I did it several times early in the day. And I really could feel um, and recall that real centered, calm feeling that I was feeling from her meditations. And so I walked into the audition. I played everything down that they asked. And it was literally like the whole audition went into slow motion. Like I'm playing the opening to Held Laban, but it felt like it took a year. I took did the next excerpt, but it felt like it took another year, you know? And it was, it was the whole thing was in slow motion. I mean, my time was, from what I know, great. Um, but I came out, won the audition, and I got to play, you know, principal horn on that. And I know that's a you know, a college audition. But to me, that was the first gateway into, whoa, I can actually do this on French horn. And so um, it, it was just mind blowing. And honestly, it opened up a whole nother level. And it really connected for me, the sports to music, um, you know, music uh, connection in terms of the, the mental game. So so that that's when I first experienced the zone. And that's what it felt like to me. And, um, you know, I've asked a lot of uh, top level professional principal horns, you know, how many, uh, how many performances a year are you happy with? And they said a year, they're like, in my lifetime, I've been happy with three, you know? And to me, that was another like mind blowing thing. And, and it's like, you know, to think about someone who I, in my opinion, is so amazing and you know, who I never hear miss notes um, to hear them say, I've only been happy with three performances in my life. And I would also say the same for me. I'm not positive. I could count how many performances I've been happy with because it's like you can always pick something apart but um but I think when you experience something like the zone um and you can get yourself there more often than not um you know the the world the world is very happy with your performance <laughs> so if, if that makes sense <laughs> absolutely and this was something I was really keen to ask you about because these days a lot of people are talking about flow and getting into flow and I think what we just discussed in terms of performance anxiety and centering and so on can really help someone get into that flow state of kind of effortless high performance. But I feel like what you just described is even a notch beyond, like it's so much more intense and vivid. And I, I'm really curious to know for you, is that like standard now? And you know, anytime you're in a high stakes situation, you flip into the slow-mo mode and everything goes amazingly, or is that like the rare extreme of what you're generally aiming for and expecting? No, I, th I would say that's the rare extreme for what, what everyone's aiming for. I mean, if you go watch, you know, any, I mean, I would say the top, top athletes in their field, I think can get themselves there the fastest. Um, I would say the top, top musicians, the same, um, or, or maybe they, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I would say the top top musicians the same. Um, I experience it um, every so often, but I think I mean, granted, you know, I said I have a one year old right now, so my sleep is not that amazing. So I would say, you know, with when all the factors align, like when you get the great sleep and the, um, you know, you're really prepared and you have the water and all these different physical things, and the, and you've been meditating or centering and um, really working on the mental game. I think they align more often. And so I would say, um, you know, the zone is something that we're always chasing. I, I don't think it's there for everybody all the time because there's too many variables. And so, um, but I, I think you experience it sometimes for a few measures in a concert. Sometimes you experience it for a phrase. Sometimes you experience it for half a page. Sometimes you get the joy of being there the entire time. Um, but I, I, I would say as for professionals, I would, uh, I would probably say that most everybody's chasing it all the time, you know, and it's, it's like that, they always talk about, I've, I've surfed a few times in my life enough to catch like one or two waves. You catch that one wave and you're just like, oh my God, I got to do this again. Um, but I, I think it's the same for the zone. You catch the zone and you're just like, I've got to, I've got to find that again, you know? And so um, I would say for anyone that's, that's experienced it, um, 
you know, and you want to get back there, look at your toolkit and what are you missing, you know, and then for anyone that has never felt it, just keep adding to your toolkit and kind of look at your preparation or your mental game or your, how you're preparing your physical self, you know, um, and just see kind of where you're, where you might have some holes and try to work on that. And, um, you know, I, I would say, I feel like I've had some great concerts in the last year and a half, especially since having a kiddo. Um, but, um, or I'd say two years, but I would say, I feel like, you know, for me, the zone, um, has happened for measures at a time, not necessarily for an entire performance lately. So I probably personally need to get back to my own toolkit as well, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> it does. Thank you. And that that's so fascinating to hear about. And I, I love that in this instance, you know, the concession prize is you perform really well and you avoid performance anxiety. <laughs> you know, if you don't flip into that particular optimal state, it's still, you're doing all the right things. So it's not like a win everything or lose everything. It's all kind of part of becoming a high performance musician. Yeah, and, and the study I've never seen, which, you know, if anyone out there is interested in doing a dissertation or a study, um, I would be curious to see of those like three performances or five performances that the top, top, you know, who we consider the top end professionals experience, um, you know, is that, are they in the zone for those? Are those just like their average day? Does that make sense? And then, um, you know, but then the ones that they're describing as their top three are those, sorry, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but I, what I would say is if the, you know, this topic, this, this, the, the ones that the top professionals are considering their highest achieving performances are those in the zone um, and everything else they're doing just an average day or, or kind of where does all that fit? You know, and so if anyone wants to do a dissertation or a, or a um, study on that, I'd be very curious to see where all that falls. For sure. So a lot of this comes up in your book that you co-authored with Don Green and another author, College Prep for Musicians. And I know that there are certainly some in our audience who are going for that college degree, or like auditioning to get in for that college degree, or there may be parents of kids who are aspiring to. And I wonder if we could just share a little bit about what's in that book and why it's so important that that manual exists for people. Sure. So I co I was very fortunate to co-author College Prep for Musicians with uh, with Dr. Don Green, the peak performance psychologist, and Kathleen Tizar, who's now the head of admissions at Juilliard. Um, and so we tackle it from, from three different angles. So I tackle it from the teacher-student angle. Kathy tackles it from the head of admissions angle. And Don tackles it from a, an audition, um, uh, you know, performance uh, angle. And so... Um, I think it's a great, very valuable tool. It's something I wish I had had when I was growing up. And part of the reason, um, at least my passion for, for co-authoring, is that when I was, you know, growing up in South Carolina, um, my parents, I had a, you know, a, a, a general contractor father who played college football, and my mom was a farmer, or is a farmer. And so, um, you know, the we didn't have much background in terms of what to do for someone who's interested in majoring music. And so that's really my passion. And, and since then, I've one of my specialty areas is I really work with a lot of high school students who are planning to go off to college to major in music. And so, um, and so the, the book is fantastic. It goes through all these different sides. Uh, it really is like a, a guide and walks you through, um, you know, how, how to cover every angle of, of a, doing the college admissions process, everything from how to do your pre-screening tapes to taking the audition. Don goes through a lot of his techniques and he he tailors them to high school students which i think is fantastic um they're also very a good entry level so for anyone listening um that might not want to get into his you know his centering course or into um some of the other courses he offers or his books um it would honestly be you could read i think it's chapter six and seven on on his material and it would be great entry level into all of his techniques including mental um rehearsal visualization um, you know, preparing for auditions or preparing for big performance. Um, and then Kathy um, tackles the book from the admission side, which is amazing because there's always so many things, uh, you know, as a student or a parent, you're wondering, well, how does this really work? And she kind of goes into all of those. And she's got um, almost 30 years or 30 years plus of experience in, in college admissions. So it's, um, I, I feel like we uncover a lot of factors and, and really make it accessible to someone who's really interested in going into music. Awesome, thank you. And uh, as I said, like I wanted to make sure we highlighted that because I know there are some in our audience who are just like, amazing, I'm so glad that exists, I'm gonna go buy it now. And as you say, actually, I remember from when I spoke with Dr. Green, those chapters in that book are a really great summary overview of his work, whether or not you're aspiring to a college degree, they are kind of universally relevant. 
Um, there was one other project I know you've done which I was really eager to hear more about and I might feel really stupid in a minute for having asked this question, but I want to know why it's called what it's called. And that's your documentary film 1M1, Hollywood Horns of the Golden Age. Um, yeah, so I, so, so first of all, so 1M1 uh, is, is what you see when you go to a recording session and you see on the stand. So the, a film, when you record a film, is divided into usually eight reels. And so they, they kind of piece the film into that um, separate segments. It obviously goes, goes back to, you know, um, the history of, of making films. And so they don't necessarily need to divide it necessarily into eight reels now because it's all, all digitally um, rec uh, filmed. But um, so the, one, the number in front stands for um, the... Um, Sorry. So the number in front stands for the reel, and then M is for music, and then the number at the end stands for the Q. So within a reel, they could have, I don't know, you know, five cues of music or 18 cues of music or 47 cues of music. It just depends. And so, um, you know, how short the cues are, how long or how much music they want or not. And so when you go record a film, you don't always know the name of the film. So sometimes they'll give it a, a random title, a working title is what they call it. Um, and so you'll show up and sometimes you don't even really know what you're recording. Um, and then, uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's always 1M18. That means real one um, music Q18 is what you're working on. So that's, that's what, where the title of the film comes from. So 1M1 is, would be the first Q of the first reel. So the first thing you usually you, you would, you know, hear in the movie. Um, and so that's, that's what it comes from. But the, so the film is, um, it's a real huge passion project. Um, I started it in my, early 20s actually and have basically done everything wrong in filmmaking in terms of making a documentary and had to come back and redo half of it um but uh it's it goes through the history of film told through the eyes of french horn players so it goes to the history of studio music and i was really fortunate when i first started this that there were um about uh i guess about 13 or 14 horn players from the like the beginning generation of of studio musicians in los angeles still alive so the guys that played on Bambi um, and you know like um, they did you know everything from Bambi all the way up to Jaws and um, you know that that whole generation of, of folks and so um, uh, so I, I was fortunate I, I spent um, I, I don't know it's still technically going because I I'm still working on the rights to some things that are in the film in terms of music and, and um, pictures but um, the, the project was really about a 10 year project. And so I did 165 hours of interviews and I, I was fortunate to also get to interview John Williams um, for the project. And um, he's amazing, I'm just amazing human, <laughs> obviously, but um, just uh, great to interview. Um, so I got to interview John Williams and then um, the, the Mancini family was fantastic. They've offered some of their archives to the film. And um, so it's, uh, it's a, a big passion project that tells the story of, of you know, film music through the eyes of French horn players, which in my opinion, um, you know, there's a lot of good horn parts, so it, it doesn't doesn't get better than that. Um, and um, yeah, so that that's that's what the film is about and the project about. And sadly, right now it's in the screening process, so I have to screen it um, if people want to watch it. But the trailer is online, and there's a website up about it. But very soon, um, hopefully in the next um, you know six months to a year, we'll have it out so that people can watch it and and see it. Amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm eager to see it myself having watched the trailer and I'm glad I now understand the title. I don't feel too stupid for not having known that. That's quite a cool insider tip. No, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, yeah. If, if you don't know, you don't know, but it's, it's like, um, you know, one, one in one is, um, yeah, anyway, we'll leave it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to ask, as someone who does a lot of film and TV score performances yourself these days, was there any really interesting tidbits or insights or did talking to those kind of original crew change your perception of your role and, and how you play in those situations? Um, let's see. Yeah. I'm, I mean, the, what was really fascinating about doing this project is, um, all of this generation of guys honestly kind of became like adopted grandparents to me. They, um, when I, when I did my recitals at, you know, for my doctorate and uh, at USC, it was amazing because half of them or all of them would sometimes show up to the recital. And so everybody in the, uh, the my other professors or even some of my friends were like, Annie, what are you doing? Why are these people here? You know, because um, you'd have like, you know, 10, 15 of the most historical French horn players, you know, at least from Los Angeles in your, in your audience. Um, and so I, I really developed an amazing relationship. And through that, um, just got a lot of really great, um, valuable information. Um, everything from, um, you know, just, just how to kind of keep, 
keep your, you know, the mental, they would all talk about the mental side, um, a lot about sight reading and how important it is to be a good sight reader. Um, Los Angeles is an interesting city, just even outside of recording work, in that you can show up and have to sight read an opera um, for someone, you know, the same night because they got sick or, or um, sometimes they, there is no rehearsal for a concert. It's just, you show up and you play the show or there's one rehearsal and it's just like an hour before the show, you know, so it's, I'm sure that's the same in multiple other cities, but as a freelancer, we experience that quite a bit. So just the importance of sight reading um, and just honestly, the history of, of French horn and the, and the, you know, just the, the studio scene. So I think um, just the importance of it in film and, um, you know, just kind of how it got from where it is to where it is now and mostly through great players that were here. Um, so I think that that's um, been really interesting. And I've, I've gotten interviewed the, the older generation plus, um, you know, the, the current generation, I mean, the generations in between. And so, um, you know, just learning the history has really been fascinating and helpful and makes you really honor the tradition that is is LA so I think that's um that's been the biggest thing I've learned from them fantastic well I have really enjoyed kind of digging into the world of Annie Bosler you have such a variety of interesting projects and expertise and poking around your website was a, a really good time <laughs> so I'd highly encourage anyone watching or listening to do the same it's anniebosler.com and of course we'll have a direct link to that and each of the projects we've mentioned in the show notes any any parting piece of advice for our audience on the topic of performance anxiety or musicality in general um, no, I, I think y'all's show is great. I would say listen to a lot more podcasts to get more areas, you know. Um, but I, I would just say for anyone that's dealing with nerves, just try to try to put more things in your toolkit. Try to, um, you know, help it out. I, I mean, it's like I said, I'm always working on it. I'm always open to new new things, and um, you know, I'm always trying to see how how I can you know help myself too. And so. Um, you know, ask, ask professional friends if you have them, try to see what they really do um, and try to have an honest conversation. And I, I, I think you'd be surprised, you know, how many people really are working on this all the time as well. Wonderful. Thank you again, Annie, for joining us today. Thank you all. So I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out. And it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.